So as I said last time, we'll very quickly review some basic programming concepts. We'll take a running problem, we'll keep expanding that problem till it becomes a problem worthy of a full-scale project or even a large-scale application system. But we'll start with some small segment of that problem. Basically, we're going to review the data representation issues the computational issues and the controlled execution of our statement in terms of decision making and looping and we'll introduce the array structures. We'll also introduce the notion of files. So this is a very speedy, what should I say, review of everything that we have done so far in the earlier part. The problem that we consider, so this is a simple computational problem. There is a house, all houses have roofs, but let us say we need to put some special tiles on the roof, maybe to prevent rainwater from leaking or whatever. And the objective is that putting tiles costs some money, we want to figure out how much money it costs given the dimensions of the roof. We note that any tiling work will require calculation of the area that is to be tiled because usually tiles will be costed on a per square feet or per square meter or per square something basis. So this is actually straightforward and we note that in C++ a program would be written something of this type. Is this correct? No. Everybody knows why it is incorrect. Cost given is per square meter. I have to calculate the area which is L into W and that has to be multiplied by cost. So this is wrong. The correct statement will be the cost will be L into W into C. This has to be assigned to some variable whose value will print. So let us say we define that variable to be simply cost is equal to this. We have to put a semicolon below after this statement. This is very straightforward. What are the data types of L, W, and C? Suppose I write here as int L, W, C. Will that be correct? Why it will not be correct? Generally, the dimensions of any house roof need not be exact integer unless you measure in nanometers or something. So you measure in meters or feet or whatever, the normal scale, it will be a fractional number. We will get to see this the moment we write down some sample data values which we will be giving as input for this program. Imagine that the sample values are that length is equal to, let's say, uh, 5.8 meters, width is equal to 2.6 meters, and let us say the cost of the roof per square meter is something like 284 rupees 50 paise, some arbitrary value. Why I do this is, it is not uncommon for people to just assume all the values to be integer. Unless you think about it like all of you did, that no, these cannot be integer. The best way is to write some representative data values that will be used in the problem. While writing these data values, you will suddenly find out that if you write L is equal to 5 meters, W is equal to 2 meters, then you know immediately that there is something wrong. All values cannot be such nice integers. So writing down some sample data is very useful 
incorrectly writing down statements in your program. And therefore we note that this cannot be in and this will have to be float. We need one more thing, which is what? The cost. So this cannot be semicolon. This has to be a comma and then I have to add a cost. The minimum that I must do is read the value of values of the variables that has been given. So I will have to have an input statement here, which will say C in L, W and C. It is after reading these values, I can do these computations and I can output. So this is the gist of my program. Should a well-written program be like this? First of all, is this program correct or wrong? It will work correctly. Nobody is saying yes immediately. I thought we had incorporated all the corrections that we found out to be missing. So is there something else that needs to be done as far as correct working of the program is concerned? So let us quickly re-examine. We have declared four variables, L, W, C and cost. We are reading in values of three, L, W and C. Then we are saying cost is equal to L into W into C. And then we are outputting the cost value as C out. So definition of variables, input of values, computations using a computational expression followed by output. That means computationally this program should work correctly. The question that I am asking is, is this how you would like to write a C++ program? If not, what else would you like to add to this program? The program will work correctly, is very fine. So you should prompt the user to input the values because he will have no clue, he will be sitting there, what values are to be given, that is one. Good. Then. Extend the same argument. If user should be prompted to give it some specific input in some specific order, should user not be told what output is coming? So input and output generally should be preceded by appropriate messages of text. So we would like to have before this scene a C out statement and along with this C out some indication that what is being printed is or what is being shown on the terminal is cost. Okay. Anything else? Ask the user to enter the valid digits. The input will generally be valid because when you are doing C in, you don't have control over individual digits or characters that the user enters. You can only examine the total value that you get in. Because in C in, the values are read as text, but interpreted and translated into internal format automatically by C in. And scene looks at individual chunks of values which are separated by white spaces, blanks or more blank. So suppose you give in a value instead of 284.50, suppose you said 28p.50. There is no way you can know that there is a, a p character or something. The scene will simply bomb. It will say invalid input. You don't know why it is invalid. And if you are inputting in a single scene statement three or four values, the error message will just show that some error occurred during this input. So you won't even know which particular value was wrong. There's no way to find that out when you are using such preliminary or uh, what should I say elementary input mechanism as C. If you really wanted to do that later on, since we know the advanced form of handling characters in a text file or in a text input, I can actually read individual characters then I can actually put aside the set of characters which are supposedly representing one value, then examine each character whether it is digit or not, or decimal point or not, then convert it using A to I or A to F functions of C++ to convert it into floating point. And if there is an error, then for each individual value I can put out an error message. In fact, internally C in does all of this, but is not very polite to you in the sense of telling you where what went wrong. So we may not be able to do that. However, his observation is correct in that if there is an upper limit, 
then it should be checked. There has to be some validation of data that is being given. For example, suppose this cost. Now, some user enters this cost as a 1 crore 25 lakh something something. Would you be interested in getting tiles fixed on your roof at that cost? Most certainly not. Nobody would be. Not in India definitely. So, therefore, you would know that there is something wrong with it. In exactly the same fashion, suppose L is 5,852 meters, now 5.8 5 kilometer long house is generally unthinkable. The point is, you, such very large numbers or very small numbers like 0.3 meter cannot also be length of the house, at least you yourself have to be able to go in, so that is not correct. The good point that he is making is that we should validate. The bad point here is there is no specification of what to validate against. And why I like this question is this is exactly what will happen in 95% of the real life problems. What kind of questions do you solve in exam? Make sure that the value is positive. The value of x is in the range 2 to 5.8. This is specified in the problem. So, you know I have to validate. But real life problems will be like this. So, you have to make some assumptions and there is nothing like correct assumption and wrong assumption. 200 assumptions might be right, 20 assumptions may be wrong and that describes the way you have applied your mind. So there, there is no unique answer, do you agree? There is no unique answer. So, let us now fix some limits on these values ourselves from our common sense knowledge of the sizes of houses and our common sense knowledge of fixing tiles on the roof. Now, fixing tiles on the roof is not something that you usually do every day or something. So, you, you would have no clue on what is the price. But let me tell you that the prices could vary drastically depending upon the nature of the tile. Some tiles which in Hindi we call khaprel could be very cheap. Some very fancy tiles could be 100 times costlier than those tiles per square meter. But still there is some limit. As you said, 1 crore rupees per square meter is unthinkable. Is 1 lakh rupee unthinkable? Perhaps. Is 1000 rupees unthinkable? Perhaps not. Is 2 rupees per square meter unthinkable? Definitely so. So, you can arrive at a judgment. The point is you have to apply your mind. You have to think. You have to think and say, okay, what should be the right values? What should be the range? And then decide that anything below this or after this will be incorrect. So, can you think now? Let us have some suggestions on what should be the limits on C, L and W. First, let us take L and W. These are common sense. Uh, yes. L should be greater than equal to how much and less than equal to how much? 5 to 15. A very modest house. So, I mean, certainly not Bill Gates house or something. Or Narayan Murthy's house may be bigger. Narayan Murthy lives in a small house, that is true, but not as small as this, that's okay. What should be the limits on W? There is another angle whenever you prescribe limits on such parameters as length and width. There is a deadly danger of what you call length being interpreted by someone as width and what you call width being interpreted by someone as length and therefore, it is prudent to put the same limits of check, it is prudent like this. And if you do not like this lower limit of 5 that every house must be minimum 5 meters wide and if you say no it should be 2, it is prudent to change this also to 2. This is just a thought. Is this a unique answer? Certainly not. Anybody else deciding anything else is perfectly fine as long as it makes sense. That is why in my question papers you will see make reasonable assumptions in case of difficulty, but state those with justification. So, you have to justify and how do you justify in a program that you write? By writing comments. The other thing that is missing in this program is comments. And these are the comments which will precisely tell a reader all the assumptions that you are making. So, there is no need 
in an exam situation to write a detailed commentary in English before the question saying, these are my assumptions. They can be incorporated right at the beginning in your, your program itself. Get your point? Fine. Anything else? Well, that more or less sums up. So we need to modify this program. We note to include what all things? We include a message to the user both before input and along with output. We include assumptions made on this and based on these assumptions, we include checks whether the values are valid or not. And if the values are invalid, we give a message, but don't do any computation. Will that be fair? Suppose there is one fellow whose house is exactly 15.3 meters. He has calculated it exactly and is giving input because you experts have written a program. And now if your message says, wrong dimensions of the house. Uh, if it is my house, I'll be very, very angry with you. This is my house, I have constructed it. Now what's your problem, it is my point. So you have to be careful about both the assumptions and you have to be very careful about the message that you give. The message must not say wrong dimensions. The message should say invalid specifications contrary to assumptions in my program. You own up the mistake. Something of that sort. Now that English you can decide whichever way you want to use it. But a professional grade program would do this. An immature grade program will do this. What you see here on the screen. Okay. In an exam situation what do you do? The minimal that you should do is do what is done here. But this minimal will not get you full score in the exam marks because that is expected that you should do validations, you should provide messages, input, output, etc. Now those things take time to write and therefore those things should come automatically. You should not have to think too much on doing those things. But that will require almost as much time to be spent on solving this question as you spent on writing these basic steps of the algorithm. There is no shortcut to it. So if this had taken say three minutes to write, Writing those things may require four minutes. But in five to six minutes, you should be able to get an absolutely correct version of the program, a professional. You get the point? Let us quickly see how long it takes to write such a program. See, I am writing a comment on two lines because I did not have space to write. But anybody who is reading it can understand what exactly I mean. I am not writing explicit limits as extra explanation. Why? Because that will be double work. 
it will be there in my if statements anyway. Do you notice what I am doing? I am trying to think like you would in an exam. Okay. How would you think when you are checking multiple conditions? This and this or this or this. So I first wrote and, then I, I wrote or, then I said and, then I am again con constructing it to or. And then I am saying, let me forget it, let me write down all the elements of the condition and then I will decide what I want to do. So I continue writing it further and I leave gaps here. Now I come back and examine what should I write in my condition. So can someone help? If C is less than this, I must get out. Or, so this should be or. This should also 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 be or. Any one of the conditions is true, I must get out. So you see now, even if there is confusion, I can revisit that confusion in correct mass. It has taken about three and a half minutes or four minutes to write this, with some thinking. It should not take longer to you. Now that's the kind of practice you must do, even in such simple problems. Invariably what happens if you refer to any textbook on programming and you have such problem, it will only go by giving you, it will say, write an expression for calculating this. Now writing an expression for calculating a given formula is a mechanical job. But solving a problem is a non-mechanical job where you have to apply your mind and writing a program is also a work of art. Where you construct something which is readable, which is understandable and which is meaningful. And you as IIT students must incorporate these habits and this way of thinking. You get my point? So that is what will be expected. Okay. 
we go ahead and complicate our life a bit more. We now say that the contractor who does this toiling work, tiling work, sorry, he toils to tile, that's okay, but he wants to earn a profit, which is natural. He has not opened a dharamshala or something to keep tiling people's houses, so he would like a profit. So how much profit? Now he has calculated this cost. Imagine there is a contractor who asks us as great programmers, saying, please write a program for solving this problem. The first problem he gave was this. We said, okay, this is the price for person. Then he says, that's a good idea, but my dear friends, this is the average cost that I have calculated. Now this average cost is based upon total number of tiles that I had purchased, total amount of money I have spent on labor, and total houses that I have tiled like this. And average cost works out to be like this. But that is my cost. Now I have to earn some profit in it. So I say, okay, what percent profit? Say 20% profit, 15% profit. Now he knows that if his profit charge is very high, that will not be fair. Because he also has to do competitive business. But he tells you one thing, that whenever he is tiling a small house, then for that his people to go to that small house, take the logistics, etc., etc., relatively cost more money than in a large house. Because large house, any like quantity discount, as you say, in a larger quantity when you do something, your overheads are less. So therefore, he says that if the house is small, I want to earn 20% profit. If the roof is middle size, I want to earn 15% profit. And I want to earn 10% profit for large houses. Solve the problem. So what is the first thing that you have to do? Suppose I am the contractor. What will you ask me? Would you like to ask me some question? What do you mean by small, large or medium? I am the contractor. I say, what? You are great IIT students. You don't know what small, big or medium is. What kind of students are coming out of IIT? The correct question to ask is not this. Why it is not this? Because what you are showing is complete refusal to make assumptions. That is what you are demonstrating when you ask this question. I will not make assumptions. The correct question to ask is, first I make some assumptions and then I ask the contractor. I believe small should be this, medium should be this, big should be this. Do you agree? Do you understand the difference? Do you understand the difference? You are willing to take responsibility and accountability. The first one says, unless you specify everything, I will not solve the problem. Second one says, I believe it should be like that. In real life, since I am not a tiling contractor and not an expert in housing, but my common sense tells me that this should be the classification. Do you agree? Which particular question do you think any contractor will like? Second. Now that is what I want you to start doing. Think, make assumptions, get them validated. But don't ask specifications for any real life problem. They will not be forthcoming. Because if you ask me the first question, define what is small, what is large, I'll think about it. Ah, you know, small is this much. Medium is this much, large is this much. Oh, these hands denote in his mind so many hundreds of square meters. But for you, what does it mean? Is a gudda guddi ka house or something like that? So you, you, you see in real life, this is required, this is necessary. So let us make assumptions. So what is small? Should be less than so many square meters. Medium should be between this and this. And large should be greater than something. Okay? Can I say anything which is less than two square meter is small? No? Less than two square meter is not small? Medium? No, no. So it is small, but is it, so what is it that I should check? Please note, I made certain assumptions on length and width. 
I cannot define something as small which is smaller than the smallest length and width. And generally we said length and width to have the same parameters as 2 and 2 on the smaller side. Just to ensure that if somebody swaps length and width, I will not get into error. But in general, one of these parameters will be larger and the other will be smaller. In, un, unless somebody wants to build a square house, which is rather rare in India. In which case, what should be the parameter for small? See, this is where you cannot give an instance answer. And you are right, you cannot give an instant answer because you have never thought like that earlier. Anything else that you have thought earlier, you would be able to come back with a quick answer. So start thinking like this. Now, tell me, what should be a small, what should be a medium, what should be large, with vis-a-vis -vis the assumptions that you have made. Okay, he is suggesting small is something which is less than 10 square meters. Medium would obviously be between 10 and and large is greater than 50. Okay, this is one classification. In general, if he says, this is my classification, are you okay with it? It is unlikely that a contractor will say no, unless he says that, look, the housing colony where I have taken this contract is a very different kind of housing colony. There could be two extremes, a housing colony for low income group people, where the large house could be smaller than your medium. The other one would be the housing colony that I am building is for very rich people. Then the largest in your meaning he will be the smallest there. So everything depends on the context and that is why it is necessary not only to make assumptions of course to show that you are able to think but also to validate them with the actual person. Then validate those inside your program is a different story. So having done that that's not a problem for you, but how will you implement it? So you'll have to calculate the area. You will introduce one more thing. So you will say somewhere in your program, you will add somebody called float area. Then somewhere in your program, you will say area is equal to L into W and you will calculate the cost separately as area into C and then you will have an if statement. You will of course, you will require one more variable which will be say profit and you will now say if area less than something. What was the number that we agreed? 10. We just write this as percentage right now. What was the other number? Do you see how if then else ladder is being used? Do you see that there is a single statement, so I need not put a curly bracket, open curly bracket, close after every, after the condition is checked because there is a single statement. So a simple if then else, if, will solve this problem. And then of course, I will have to calculate another thing which is called the price. There is no harm if I keep writing float something, float something later on rather than inserting something. The other choice in an exam kind of situation is to leave that blank and the moment you come up with a requirement of a variable name, you put that name in your declaration before going further. Okay. So these are some of the tricks to save time. Now what will you do? 
you will first calculate cost as equal to uh, whatever C, oh that you have already calculated. So what will be the price? Cost into 1 plus profit by 100. Notice that 1.0 and 100.0 is not required because profit, profit is a floating point variable. So even if I wrote 100 here, this 100 would be converted to floating point, integer is converted to floating point. So I will get a proper division and this one even if I write, it will also be converted to floating point before being added. But it is prudent as a professional programmer to automatically write constants as floating point constants if you know the result is going to be in floating okay although that is not wrong so this this problem is also not not a very very difficult problem to solve but here again one may make mistakes in doing variety of things one the assumptions so you'll have to write assumptions here additional assumptions and the second in the correct sequence in which you evaluate if then else and the or and and that you write in your if statement. You could easily make a mistake. For example, here, if I wrote this as or, what would happen? Either this or that, profit is equal to 15. Either this means, even if it is 10,000 square meter house, or less than this means, it is 0.5 meter square meter house. However, if it is less than 10, you would not come here at all. So this, in the else if, this is un unnecessary. Do you notice that? Because I have written else, if I were looking at each condition separately, if, 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 separately, then all this would be necessary. But in this particular case, since I am coming here with else, what is redundant here? Can you tell me what condition is redundant in this else if? I need not write it. I would not come here at all if the area is not greater than or equal to 10. So that is implied. That is the advantage of if then else ladder. But you can choose which way to implement. You can write completely independent if statements. You can write opening curly bracket, closing curly bracket, whichever way you want. Just ensure that your logic is correctly written. And I am telling you that in an exam situation, in spite of your 100% accurate knowledge in your mind, you may in a hurry make some small silly mistake here or there. And that should be avoided because a professional programmer does not make mistakes. Or if a professional programmer makes mistake, in the second reading of the program, which is always done before submitting that program for compilation, always. Not like what I have seen you doing in the lab. You, you write a program and say C++. And the compiler says, here, oh, 35, oh, semicolon missing. 58 something. That's not what a professional programmer does. You are lucky because you can compile your program in split seconds. Okay, if you have read the book Madhouse, which is Hostel 4 students had written, then you will see there a figure carrying deck of punch cards, which had statements like what you write in a G edit today. And you would submit the deck of punch cards today evening and go home. And tomorrow evening again you come back to collect one compilation run. Now there you don't have a choice to say, oh, semicolon, oh, something. Every semicolon missing is one day. So if you are not careful, you may spend your entire semester only trying to compile your program. The logical errors will come later as you know. So that is why you have to be very careful when you write. And therefore you have to read whatever you have. And in an exam situation, whatever be the compulsion, after you have completely written a program, at least read it afresh, once again, okay? We make life more complicated. Now that the contractor is very happy with your programming skills, he says, great guys, they can give me a computer program, I don't have to calculate anything. He says that, look, I am getting this contract for tiling work, 
by all the residents of the colony. Now I have, my Munim has a diary where he says house number, length and weight. I will ask him to give you that diary. Now what you do is you calculate the price that I should charge to each of the house owners. So give me the house number and the price I should charge. I don't need anything else. The input information I'm giving you is house number, width and length and width of the room. To solve this problem, we should always first like to write a sample data. It's always a good idea to write some sample data so you get an idea of what you have to handle. In the earlier case, the sample data was length, width, the cost per square meter, and the percentage profit was something which was calculated intrinsic into my program. Here, I don't have one house only. He is telling me I will give you house numbers and length and width. So I will have, let's say, the data maybe, suppose I have to input, input the house number, length and width. I will say, okay, first I will, I will find out how many houses you have. So he said 250 houses in the colony. So I will like to input 250 as the first number and then press enter. Then I will put, say, house number one, length is 6 meters, width is 3.8 meters. House number two, length is 7.3 meters, width is 4.2 meters. House number three, say, 10.0, 5.6, whatever. This looks reasonable assumption that the data would be given to me like this. Now here is a question. If I want to read the data and produce the output for every house, what is the tiling price, then I need to do exactly what I did earlier, but I need to do it repeatedly. I need to do it repeatedly. And I need to read one more thing called house number now, which was not there earlier. The first value which is being accepted is the number of houses. So I will need to add integer n, which is number of houses. And I will call it hn to mean house number. I will have a statement c in. I will require to set up an iteration and in this I have to do everything that I have done except in the see out statement I will have to now put out Something like this. So for every house number, I will print the price. And of course, I will have the iteration come concluded for this part. I need to take care of putting an end L at the end of each line. Each line, there will be one end. So this is a reasonably accurate program. Yeah. Oh, C out would be I. He says C out should be I instead of H I because I am running the iteration for 250 times for I equal to 1 to L. His thinking is not incorrect given the way we think normally in problem solving. You have assumed that just because somebody has said 250 is exactly data for 250 houses. Have you ever done? writing down of values in a survey in a, in a colony. You want to measure the roof, you go to each house, house number one, this house number two, this. 
house number three lock on the house i don't have data house number four house number five i have data the munim's diary that you take and contractor has told you there are 250 houses in this colony the munim's diary may contain data only for 245 houses and which 245 houses not necessarily 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 that is why there is a house number and that is why another important assumption that you have to make whenever you are dealing with large data that some of the data could be missing so far you had assumed, assumed validity of data or invalidity now you have to assume incompleteness of data any time you do any engineering experiment and record the experimental results you will goof up somewhere or the other some data point will be missing okay that is natural to happen in any human activity therefore you have to read in the house number let me ask you another question suppose all the data was absolutely available is there any need to actually read the house number at all as input no, because first will be first house number, second will be second house number, third will be third house number. Why are we reading it? We want to make sure that in that Munim's diary, whatever is written, house number and dimensions are correctly captured. And you will find that in a large diary, something will be missing. <coughs> you are required to write diary for every day, whatever you do in your about your project. The diary format has not been put up, although I had discussed it here. Two days of this week have gone. Have all of you written entries for two days in your personal diary? All of you? No. Now what will happen on Friday when your team or Saturday or Sunday, whatever is the weekend time, and your team comes, the team leader tries to accumulate all the times. One day is missing for this person, two days is missing for that person. Now this is happening in an environment where you are working as professional programmers on a project. Would this not necessarily happen in a real life situation where Munim is sending some clerk to go around and get some data? So please don't make assumptions about either that the data is valid or the data is complete, particularly when the large data is. This is one point. The second point is more important. I have set up an iteration which executes 250 times or whatever be the number written here. Suppose that number and the actual values available do not tally, then what will happen? I have only 245 sets of values, but the number given is 250. What will happen? Remember, I am inputting the data one at a time. And this iteration is going on. It will, of course, give me messages, give the next house number and this. The last house number is quite likely to be 250, actually. The missing data would be somewhere in between, which I would not know. But my loop goes on up to 250 times. Is that fair? Is that realistic? No. So therefore, what I must do is, I must set up a mechanism to terminate my iteration whenever I say there is no more data. No question of first saying that these many data points are there. And that is why, instead of having my data, organized in this fashion, I will organize my data in a fashion such that this is not there. The data is, I will type house number, length, width, house number, length, width. And whenever I have no house number to type, I will give you an indication to your program saying whenever I type this value, please terminate the program. Typically, such a thing would be minus one. Since in a single input statement, you will be reading three values and you don't want the program to bomb because C in statement encountered some error, you will give some values arbitrarily here. This is how you will type in your input. Do you get the point? So it is, it is not fair to make an assumption that the number of input values are predefined. Such assumption can be made only when the data to be captured by you is actually automatically captured or is captured through some other process, validation has been done, and this value of number of houses or whatever has been actually correctly calculated for that data and has been given to you. 
such would be the case for example when you read data from an image file because an image file by definition contains the length and width of the image as part of the data that is the nature of the format you don't need to do any validation there but in all such cases in real life computing you will have to make some so do you agree that this would be a better way but if this would be a better way how will i run my iteration now so this will not be there instead what will i say while hn the only thing is to begin with there is no hn so whenever you implement any iteration using while you will have to take care of first reading one set of input before the while and then process it inside the while and then before going for the next iteration you again read the next value so that you always check the condition for a value which is there or not there you get the point yeah okay what he is saying is you run the loop for n but if you run the loop for n you are necessarily required to read a value of n to begin with which is what is the assumption that no you cannot do that so that is why he is saying a technically what he is saying is correct i can run a for loop and in that condition here i less than equal to n i can also say and hn not equal to minus so combination of conditions either i have to run 250 times or i can terminate if i get a house number as minus both of that is okay the only problem is the reason we thought of minus 1 is because we don't want to exactly count how many data points are there so n will not be there okay so this is this is clear no no issues on this okay. now here is a question i have written this program and now i have read it i think it is correct now i type this program compilation is correct and i start executing the program so i give this value so what is that i i input this value 16.0 something calculates 27.3 37.3 i suddenly find out oh there is some problem the calculation is not coming correctly what will i have to do i have to go back and examine what expression i have written for l into w and whatever i'll go back there then i start typing again i re execute now the values are coming correctly but suddenly somewhere i give let's say 128 houses i have got correctly inputted data and 128 correct results i have got 129th house that lallu munim has written 100 meters instead of 10 meters 100 meters is invalid as per your assumption what your program does shout 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 return one program ends still another 110 houses are remaining now what will you do you say okay program ended here this was invalid correct that value on your paper again execute the program again start typing these values if on an average something goes wrong after you have typed in about 100 sets of values every time you run the program and you have to run the program let's say 5 times how much time will you be typing the data again and again and again and again and again same data which you have on on the piece of paper that is the reason why we have this mechanism which ought to be utilized which says i should be able to use a input redirection and output redirection so i will actually create a file of data which i will call let us say house data dot txt in which i will write house number 1 2 3 4 6 let us say 7 8 12 whatever even if they are missing because they are house numbers now and the values and there is minus 1 i will prepare this file using gedit for once because i don't want to do the godagiri of typing this data again and again and again when my program blocks and now suppose my program was let's say price dot cpp then when i compile it i would like to execute it by saying dot slash a dot out 
less than house data and all that. Do you understand the significance and importance of this operating system feature? It is not a C++ programming feature. It's an operating system feature which says that instead of collecting the data from C in, you can redirect C in to any text file. It will read the lines from that text file as if you have been typing data on the keyboard. So the keyboard gets connected to this. So when you run this program like this, your first C in statement will read data here. There is a small problem now. If you run your program like that, you are getting data which you have prepared for house number, length of house, width of house. What happened to the cost? Let's go back to your program which you have been extending again and again and again. You started by saying Sure, you will not read L and W now, but you will have to read the cost. Where is the cost? You have to therefore remember that the data file that you create will have to contain all the data for which you have seen statements in your program. You are reading the cost per square meter separately somewhere in the program. And therefore, the first entry here should not be this. The first entry here should be some cost, let's say whatever, 252.50, whatever. In short, this text file should be prepared. This text file should be prepared to contain lines of data in exactly the same sequence in which your C in statement should be executed. Because once you say dot slash a dot out less than here, there is no way a C in statement will ever collect data from your keyboard. Keyboard is disconnected now for execution of that program. That keyboard is connected to that input file. So you have to make sure that the input file is prepared properly. Yeah, is that obvious? Any, any question in this? Okay. Similarly, the output that you produce will come on screen. Now you have prepared a perfect program and now you tell the contractor I have calculated all the values. He will say, where are the values? Say, oh. They, they, they appeared on my screen yesterday night when I executed that program. So contractor says, my dear friend, is this the way you want me to run your business? How do I run my business? Do I come to your computer? You at least give me a file on a pen drive or something. So you will need to create an output file as well. Now you are already creating an output on the text and that's the reason why you have the facility of redirecting the output as well. And to say something like price, oh sorry, this, this should not be that, this should be txt and price data dot txt. So this is greater than means whatever output would have come on your terminal, it should go to a file. Nothing will appear now. So please note that less than and greater than will disconnect keyboard and terminal and connect whatever input file name you have given and whatever output file name you have given. These files have to be ordinary text files and they should be prepared such that various lines in that text file contain data which will be read by your C in statements. The C in statement is now reading from here. Now do you agree that this simple facility will permit you to give the data from your input, collect the data from your output on a file and give that file to the contractor so when you give that file to the contractor, the contractor can go through each one and says, thank you very much. That is how you will do business. You want us to write a program, this is the, you will call it, you know what will you call it? A billing program for your tiling activities. And you say, I will generate bills for you. You pay me 5 rupees per bill. So 250 houses, he will say, okay, 5 rupees. Instead of making my munim calculate, you will do all the calculation. But then he will say, Please don't give me just the list of house numbers and the price. Give me a bill which will say house number one. It will say Mr. or Mrs. so and so. And then it will say some text message. 
with respect to the tiling work that I have done in your house. I beg to submit my bill. Total area tiled, so much. Price, so much. You are sincerely. Please pay the bill within 10 days. And one page bill. You can imagine the contractor going with a list and tearing off papers in one small slip saying house number two, house number three, house number four. That doesn't work. How will you create such output? Well, you can create it using your C out statements. All that you do is you print the house number, you print the text that he wants, you print the price. How do you go to the next page? What is the equivalent of page? You have never printed anything on a printed paper. You have outputted everything onto terminal. What is the notion of a page? A computer page, you would have printed some documents which are stored in computer files on printers using maybe a word processor like a Microsoft Word or Adobe Reader or something like that. You do get multiple pages, right? How many lines are there in a page? Nobody has noticed. Nobody is curious. But I'll ask you a harder question. After printing 20 lines, you have printed the information about one fellow's bill. The next bill, you want to come onto the next page. How do you ensure that it will come onto the next page? Okay. I will leave it to you. I'll explain this next time. In all word processors, there is a notion called page break. When you say insert a page break, the next line will appear on the next page. Go to that text file and find out that at the point where you have inserted a page break, what is the character that is stored inside? It will have an ASCII code. That ASCII code is an instruction to the printer to go to the next page. It is part of the printer's escape sequences. We will not go into those details, but it is possible to do so. What I would like to discuss in five minutes and leave the thought to you is as follows. Since now you are working as professional programmers group and want to make money by writing programs, you have approached that contractor and told him, I will prepare a billing system for you. The contractor says fine, but there are two stages. First, there are houses. So I have details about house numbers and the owner of the house, the name of the owner of the house. Then, I will give you all that data for all the houses. That data will not contain length, width, anything. Because this is the contract I am taking from that colony. My Munim will first go and take names of the people who live in those houses. Okay. So, you will, he says, I will get you one diary of that Munim, which has house number, name of the house, and some other details. What could be the nature of the details there? From a business perspective. Can you imagine some very creative details? Normal details could be the dimensions could be put there itself. But there could be several other parameters. Every household may say, out of the five or six different types of tiles available, I want to put this type of tile. Would you not like to decide that for your house? So you'll ask the contractor how many different tiles you have. He will say, this tile, madam, 1,000 rupees, this tile, 2,000 rupees square meter, whatever, whatever whether it is roof or flooring. So, the decision by the household on which type of tile he wants to put on. Now, this data is available separate. The next data is completed tiling on this house number, this length and this width. That is in another pothi. So, there are two pothis now you have. Now, you have a problem. You say see in. You are, you are expected to read the first pothi, which will say house number this, and the name of the person is this. Why it is required? Because for all house numbers, you may have the details of who stays where. But for all house numbers, you may not have the tiling details because you may not have completed the tiling. Now the contractor will say, look, Baba, I do 20 houses per week. I'll give you data for those 20 houses. Give me those 20 bills. You can't say that complete all 250 because that is how I have written my program. And come after three months. Now, the contractor will say, after three months, if I prepare the bills, 
and if I give to my clients, when will I get my money back? I must build them the moment I finish my work. What I am hinting at is that reading all the data in one stage and solving the problem is not feasible in real life. Second, it is not therefore feasible to have all data in a single file even if you want to use redirection. So you will be required to say, I will read data which is prepared in one file which is about the owner of the house and the type of tiles he wants. I will have another file in which there is data about house number, size of the uh, uh, tiling that is required and the date on which I completed the tiling work. Because if I am giving a bill, I should write that date on which the tiling work was done. And there would be a third file or a small notebook in which sundry details like categories of tiles I have, pricing or cost for each tile, the pricing information that I want, etc., etc. would be given. It is very clear that C in statement alone cannot be used because C in will read from one source. That source can be either your keyboard or that source can be your terminal. But cannot be this file, that file, that file. Later on when we consider files in an object oriented environment, we will see that files declared as objects can actually use a C in operator in each of those files separately. But what is clear to us is input will have to be read from different files and at different positions. And I may not write a single program for the billing system. I may write one program which will collect all the data about the owners of the houses, maybe another program which will collect data about the sizes of the roofs and a third program which will only collect the date on which the tiling was done and will produce the bills. So you see what we started with a simple expression evaluation, but such expression evaluations always happen in the context of a larger problem. And as an important aspect of this course, you ought to learn to worry about those larger problems and you ought to be able to solve those larger problems. That is why what project you are doing, for example, you are taking a larger problem and solving it. We'll stop here, but I would like you to read the, you remember we had discussion on files. There is one more thing which I will just mention here, but we'll discuss it in the next class on Friday. And that is about use of arrays. We have not done anything with arrays so far in this revision. But you will appreciate that if I am reading data about 200, 300, 500 houses, okay, then it is better to keep that data in arrays. For example, if I have two files in which I have house number and name of the house owner, then it is best to keep the array of the names of character arrays of two dimensional array and house number. Then later on when I read the data from another file, about the dimension, it is better to keep that in some other area. Since house numbers are one to something, it is perfectly all right if I don't use my array index to start with zero. I will let that zeroth element be there without using it so that I am logically doing what the house numbers are done. The house number therefore becomes an index for me. That is how you would use arrays. We will see how this problem is extended to be solved using multiple files, but text files still. You still, each one of these are text files. So they can, you can use either C in statements to read from different files or the equivalent open file statement which is what we shall see in the next class. Thank you so much.